Hello, Hello. Sakya. Hi, hi, how are you? It's been a long time, hasn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, I want to, sorry, sorry. Um, um, uh, I'm Sukhdev, I'm Sukhdev Sandhu, um, and, and, I, and I teach and write. Um, and I, I thought I'd start be, uh, because I've been thinking about you a lot in the last few months as somebody who thinks <laughs> and has written um, incredibly and sometimes um, extrapolating and sort of prophesy, prophesizing um, how things sort of turn out for cities in the West and not just in the West. And many, many, so I, I guess my first question is, um, what has been, what, what's uh, positive about the last six months for you? What have, <laughs> what have you encountered that rather than the kind of the litany of righteous doom that we could all enumerate, right, right. are there positives that we can draw from this? Yes, I think, and the positives partly have arisen out of a spirit of contesting some of the horrors that are also sort of appearing. And I'm not just thinking of the virus, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of a whole variety of issues. So, so it is, it is quite, it's quite notable to see how the outside world is engaging us in many ways, in ways that, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, you and I were both already on this planet then, uh, uh, it maybe engaged us less, you know, we were more preoccupied with our own experiences, our own thinking, and now we are really engaged by this larger planet. <laughs> and, and I see that in my students as well. I find that sort of interesting and worth noting. You know, I, I don't know where it goes, frankly, but that is sort of a first, uh, a first element. Um, should I just keep on talking? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and then the second element that to me is become very important. It, it wasn't always really, but it's this notion of the capabilities that cities have, the capabilities to keep a certain type of peace, huh? a very special kind of peace in a setting of such major inequalities, of such major injustices, of the rich, the very rich and the very poor. And what is it about urban space or a city really uh, that makes that possible? You know, we should really learn to respect that possibility, because it tells us something about us people. It's not just about the buildings and the cities, you know, it really has to do with how we uh, connect with each other, etc. We may be a bit rude at times, but it's not war. Even if you just threw me on the floor by accident in a mad rush to catch a, fly, a, a train or whatever, uh, it's still, it, if it happens in a city, it's different than if it happens on a highway, right? And so there is a, and, and I, so I, I sort of am thinking about the capabilities that the urban condition has produced. At the same time, one then also has to say, well, a city, if a city doesn't have that, it becomes a war zone. Right? It, it is a very dramatic either or, one could say, you have to more or less get it all together, or you have a kind of a war zone where people would just hate each other. And of course, we have some cities where this is beginning to happen huh? in, in very partial ways, but, but Komem, uh, you know, it's not always peace. We are very lucky, I think, those of us who have, which is the majority of cities, you know, who live in cities that are more or less reasonable, uh, no matter the extraordinary inequalities in each of our cities. Are you going to be asking me some more questions or? Yeah, well, we, uh, we could just kind of riff, riff off uh, each yes. other, okay. um, I guess. Um, I, I, I guess I've sort of spent most, most of the last six months um, sort of caught up in New York, um, both frilled by certain energies being released, maybe sort of for, uh, a kind and of perfect storm in a way of political violence and sort of police brutalities and people being muzzled effectively or self-muzzling and they're coming together because it's the only thing you could do for most of the summer. There's nowhere to go to, there's no third space, there's no indoors space, exactly. you're home exactly. and then 
an yeah. outdoor that you're discouraged from going out to, but you break through that sort of self-censored bodily censorship in order to, to scream out, to shout out en masse in a way that I haven't, have never seen in, my, in the 20 years or so that I've lived in New York. And to, to, your, to your point also about the, the, the excitement in the mornings of going in the street and seeing banks broken, bank windows broken, police cars <laughs> and, and the good burgers of the West Village, who normally are quite censorious. Yes. <laughs> sort of being almost understanding this time that something has something has changed, something needed to be changed. Yeah. Normal, normally the next morning litany after a riot is, who are these people? Where do they come from? Yeah. This is not good politics. There was yeah. an understanding this yeah. time. That yeah, absolutely, it's really true. Yeah. But it's also partly because the conditions have become much harsher. The illusions or the expectations that in a near future, everything will be better for me and my family or for my children, etc. It's gone. We know now too much under those conditions, I think, you know, once you drop the illusions, I mean, some of us, of course, have very good lives, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. We love the city. But let's remember that probably over half of the residents of the city have a hard time, long trips, arrive tired at the work, at, at the workplace, etc. And so in that sense, how is it possible that such a mix of people where we sort of hit each other accidentally or not so accidentally, and that there is peace, not war. That I think is an achievement. And, and I think across the centuries, the city has had that capacity huh? to somehow, that doesn't mean that it's always beautiful, that doesn't mean that it's always peaceful, that doesn't mean that it's always nice, not at all. It can be harsh. But it's a harshness that we humans, in a way, can sort of accept. Huh? The, the other issue that I'm sort of um, uh, really interested in is the capacity of a city, a working city. It doesn't have to be a fancy city, but it's a working city, is um, to render conflict into the civic. You know, that civic, the civic doesn't just fall ready-made from the skies. The civic emerges often, I think, from situations where it's necessary to live with each other, to work with each other, you know. And, and so it forces us, in a way, to be a bit, uh, how would you say, sabio? I'm thinking in Spanish. Now, how's your Spanish? Not so good? Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> sort of a, a kind of wisdom. It's a very partial little type of wisdom, but when we are in a, in, a, in a crowded city, but a working city, it's quite interesting to see how we sort of acquire a, a bit of a tolerance that we wouldn't have in some other places, you know, that, that is sort of uh, one of the issues for me. Okay, can that sustain? I mean, one of the things just experientially a number of people talked about yeah. is it feels like... Um, you know, living amongst highwaymen <laughs> these days, uh, they, you know, <laughs> the friend or foe. Uh, you, you can't see people sometimes or experience them with, with, with a mask. And we are encouraged to be suspicious of other people. In some work situations, we are encouraged to report people for not obeying certain sort of codes the, uh, these, these days. And do, do the values and the, the, the values of tolerance and entanglement and a kind of battered sharedness that seem to come to the fore in yeah. cities historically, do you think that, that they will fundamentally continue to sustain or do you think there's going to be significant kind of changes? Well, I think, look, in the case, when I think of the cities where I have lived, right, let's just say New York City, to keep it simple, I've also lived in Chicago, etc. It seems to me that there was a time in the 1970s when cities were mostly bankrupt because the city was not the main space for operations, for engagements, for the city was sort of a, a decaying condition. Certainly it was the case in Manhattan and I know in several other cities. I don't know what country you are in, but there was a time when the cities were falling a bit apart. There was not money, they were poor. Then comes a new epoch, and it has to do ironically with globalism. 
And at that point, all kinds of actors began to see the need to exist in a city, to operate in a city, to have access to the variety of advantages that a city offers, to do their global trading, their global, whatever, financial operations. So the, the, what has happened now when we see so many uh, uh, businesses in the city, it didn't just fall from the sky. You know, I think that it was a transformation also of the kind of economy that inhabited a major city like New York, like Paris, you know. And you see in all of these cities, a certain type of modality, which is also one that connects to the outside world, eh? that connects with other countries. So I think that internationalism, to put it in this, the more commercial version of internationalism, I'm talking about, not that other good internationalism, but given the commercial version of internationalism, cities, were significant spaces, became significant spaces in a way that they had really lost that role. Uh, remember, I like to mention that how many cities were broke in the 1970s. I don't know where you live, but cities were really stressed out, so to say. And then comes this new epoch, which is an internationalism, where cities suddenly become these, these sort of these hot spots from where all kinds of things can emerge. Um, that didn't mean that everybody was nice there. Now, one of the, the, the issues, of course, for me is this whole question of high finance. You know, I do a lot of work on that. In high finance, brilliant people, extraordinary concentrations of wealth, <laughs> but they don't really, they, they don't exhibit that. You know, they sort of keep it rather quiet and they, they, they're not exhibitionists about the amounts of wealth that they have. And, and that to me, it has, of course, been a bit of a, this is the angle which I criticize, that the city becomes a space that is more and more expensive, that still needs food, etc., but that those sectors did not get, uh, you know, better conditions, better economic conditions. They were stuck with very sort of the modest working classes. They were stuck, and they are still stuck with very expensive prices that they didn't invent and, and they are neglected. They are, we are really neglecting. I would say that the last 20 years have been pretty brutal uh, as the cities become richer and richer, more and more significant, partly because of globalization. And then you have this, this, uh, this misery of people who have to work very hard to have extraordinarily long trips and, and all of that. What do you think about all of this? I'm just chatting away here with yeah. you. Well, one of, the, one, of the, one of the sounds of the summer, I think, for people in many cities or all around the world has been usually around 7 p.m. or so, uh, where people go into their kitchen cabinets, get some saucepans and kind of bang away cacophonously yes, to yes. notionally sort of celebrate right. Uh, both the real and almost the, the symbol of the frontline worker. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. The frontline worker who often lives maybe two hours away from uh, the, the center of the city, the frontline worker who has to go to use public transport with all its perceptions of danger and contamination. Yeah. And to the extent that you know, you know, war, wartime situations or dark situations are an, uh, an opportunity to create new myths of togetherness, new symbols um, that will sustain us go, going forward. I, I guess I'm curious about if there is some kind of symbolic realignment going forward about forget the CEOs or, right. or maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe diminish them a little bit, put them in their place and think about uh, uh, the, the people in the hospitals, the cleaners, the janitors, the person who works in Gristides on, on a, in, the, in the checkout desk. No, absolutely. No, I think that is one of the, this is one of the really strong negatives in our major cities. And that is that the, it's not just the 1%, you know, the famous 1%. They have long existed. They're not going to go away either. But it's another 20 or 30% of very high income households that put create a, a kind of crisis even at the level of consumption because most shops are catering food shops are catering to these to these households and so the very low income workers 
uh, they also get to pay those very high prices, you know. And and I, I would think that I, I have spent quite a bit of time in Europe, and uh, I think Europe just manages that better, and that mostly European countries. And it tells me that that it could be done better. I think the United States. I don't know where you live, by the way. I'm in New York most of the time. Where? I'm in New York. New York. In New York. York. Okay. Well then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, there is a kind of basic food injustice, I would say, I like that image of food injustice, because low income workers also are stuck with the higher and higher prices that we now pay for a tomato for whatever, you know, we want to eat. And how do we, how can we get traction on creating a bit of more solidarity, etc. And, and sometimes I do think that, that many of the rich would be happy to make it easier huh, to, to survive in a city for their lower income, whatever, uh, shops and all of that. Uh, but it's so difficult to get going. You know, I, I've thought of, I have this long list of things that we could be doing because they're not exceptional, etc. that would make a little difference to a lot of people, a little difference that counts. It's almost impossible to get that going. Why? That is what I would like to know. Why is it that in a large, in a big city, you can't quite get that together? There are little partial initiatives like, you know, in, 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 the, in New York City, uh, some, there, there are some neighborhoods that have really tried very hard, et cetera, et cetera, which is admirable, but it really is difficult. Why is that? I mean, what is the failure? Is it that we, we the residents of these cities, don't have voice in a way that we can connect with other people, you know? It, I mean, I, I don't understand why it is so difficult to get something going that a majority agrees for. Why? I mean, and, and then you look at the European cities. Look look at Paris, I love Paris, you know, the, 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 you know, the six minute or whatever, 15 minute <laughs> city, you know? So they say, let's just do that that we could just walk to the shops and they do it. You know, it's a mayor, it's not the president of the country. So, so and, and that is just one of many, these types of items, you know, the, the, what we cannot do. That is what really interests me right now that should be possible to do. I mean, not going to the moon in other words, eh? not that, <laughs> but what we could do, why can't we do it? And now I, when I was in Chicago, at the University of Chicago, I, we were in a, uh, the, the university there is very close to a very, very poor black neighborhood. Well, our, our students, you know, who were activist students, et cetera, in my class at least, they started to work in the poor neighborhood. They brought uh, food to plant, you know, planting food, et cetera. And, and they just used any little bit of, of, of terrain that was available to grow. And they actually reinvented a whole side of that part of the city that is close to the University of Chicago. It was just wonderful. These were students in my class who said, yes, let's go do it. And, uh, and we should have more of that, you know? We have all these planners. I don't have anything against planners. Are you a planner? Certainly not. <laughs> okay, but you know, <laughs> Can't they do something more? And then I look, I'm Dutch. I look at the Dutch, little country, half the country is underwater, ocean level, you know, and look what they do. So they set up a huge platform to have cows, you know, on the river, on the big river, that, and that river is Mouvementé, eh? that moves. <laughs> you know, they, they just sort of throw themselves into projects that, that we would think, you yeah. know, we could do in any place. The Dutch are getting taller. And Americans are getting smaller. Yeah, that that's another problem. It really is an issue, you know. Dutch men are simply out of control when it comes yeah, to yeah. height. They are, <laughs> the rates of uh, I'm, I'm particularly I'm mostly not interested in statistics, but I am drawn to statistics about uh, ch childhood happiness. And to your point, disproportionately, uh, I think all of the top fifteen countries where children are happiest are in Northern Europe. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Portugal comes 1748. You know, the, the, of, of the history of Europe is, of course, interesting because let's remember that in the 1600s, there were all these war zones, all these separate, you know, king, little kingdoms. 
And they got tired of war long before, uh, you know, we in the West, uh, you know, should have, of course, also been tired of war. Uh, we had terrible wars, World War I and World War II. But it is quite interesting to see how after five years of war, that was it. You know, in both cases, they said, okay, enough. This is how far we can get. You know, there is something actually very practical about that modality rather than look at the wars that we see now, in, you know, in some regions of the world. Wars with no end because they're asymmetric wars, right? You have a, you have a formal army, but the other side is not a formal army. So there's not going to be an agreement. Well, uh, I, um, I was born in England, and uh, when I'm in England now, I'm struck by how much of the news, good or bad, comes from across the Atlantic. And yeah. this absorption and kind of in, uh, this one, one rarely uh, hears about what's happening um, in the Netherlands or what's happening in Austria <laughs> um, or Brussels. I don't, I don't want to suggest Austria or the Netherlands right. are the future, but I do, I do wonder, you know, taking a kind of sort of broad view at the moment, if part of our lurch us, uh, towards something a bit more optimistic, something a bit more a future that is usable, has to involve a kind of relegation at every level of, of America as any kind of even... Uh, yeah. magnetic center. The US, the Americas in general, actually, because I also grew up in Argentina and we all know about Brazil, the horrors of Brazil. I mean, the Americas, except for the, I mean, the, the, they're in the North, they're pretty good, but the United States and then from there down on, it is of a brutality. You know, some of the worst uh, modes of combat and disagreements have happened in Central America, for instance, and in certain parts of South America. I mean, it's brutal. Uh, we also have, of course, that in the in the in the eastern regions from Europe, etc. But really, it is very problematic, and I and one doesn't have a good sense as to where it goes. You know, how does this end? Um, it's very troubled. It used to be that the north of Africa, you know, the part that is sort of. Uh, uh, that we worried about that falling into war. Well, as in fact, it, it's other parts which are much worse off, I would say, right? Um, and and the whole Iran, Iraq situation for the longest of times was terrible. Bangladesh also in deep trouble. I mean, it really, India, I find India very problematic. You are from India. Uh, yeah, my parents are. Yeah, yeah. I find India with all its brilliant, brilliant minds. I mean, the, the, the scholars in India that I got to know, they're just extraordinary, but it's so brutal. All that poverty, you know, why can't not more be done? Do you have an answer? Um, I certainly do. I, uh, uh, I have a question, <laughs> as uh, people in my profession often do. Um, um, do you, uh, if we think about institutions or kind of nodes of some kind of resistance, how does the university of the future look like? Does it have to change? Must, must it change? I think many parts must change, yes. I think that, for, and, and for starters, I'm not even talking about an intellectual aspect. I am talking about the responsibility that our universities should have vis-a-vis -vis their students to enable them. It's not that, okay, one, you took your course, you got your grade, out, you disappear, you know, I don't care. Now, of course, some of these universities are enormous, they're big, but they also have, if they are very big, they also have a lot of profs, a lot of assistants. There should be a way in, in which the university becomes um, an enabler that goes beyond the university. I mean, we know that we who are in good universities, we know how privileged we are. You know, I mean, this is just amazing life. You get tenure at whatever, 23 or 28, and, and that's it, you know? And we know that in the United States, the majority of professors, as soon as they get tenure, they just don't work anymore, you know? I mean, and, and then if we could then use those, okay, you don't want to go on writing books or whatever, fine. But then about how enabling the poor neighborhoods, you know, I mean, something rather than, I don't know what they do with their time, but 
you know, you know, the, you know the story, right? In the United States, most most retire most people who re, who get tenure stop really working seriously. I mean, they might teach, but they don't do books. They don't do anything. Um, that's a rather disturbing data, I, I would say, and it's unjust, you know. Oh, I mean, if we think. Um in terms of a broader knowledge economy and how people get paid and how people get status or are allowed to do the great things that they do. The monopolization of, of resources in some um, respects of a, of a modern private university is terrible and incredibly politically, socially, intellectually deleterious. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, we have a role in sustaining it because- <laughs> We evidently have been very good at sustaining <laughs> Right, yeah. universities. Yeah, do you do you feel as some as somebody who's been so foundational for many people in thinking about cities? And you kind of alluded to this earlier. I mean, we've both been living through, in a way, the the redemption of the city. Maybe we think of our work in part as a kind of centering of the city and a, and a redemption of the city. Um, it's a, it's a cause, or it felt like a cause to to, to some extent compared to the social um, situation in the 1960s and the 1970s in, ma in many countries. Um, with everything that's been happening in, uh, in the last six months, do you feel that we are about to move into a different kind of epistemic shift where the city, as we've conceived it, isn't necessarily, you know, the great telos, it isn't uh, the, the, in a way the, the center of our dreams and our ambitions? Yeah, no, I think that, and, and I, I think that what we're also seeing, say, in the United States, in the Midwest especially, and is the, the desirability of smaller cities. You know, the Midwest is a very well-functioning, you know, it has all these great universities. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's a particular region. We call it the Midwest, but, you know. Um, uh, and, and so what you have there is an effectiveness of the educational system that projects itself well beyond uh, just the university. You know, when you think of these mid-sized towns that we have in the Midwest of the United States, have you ever been there? Yeah. Just a little. Yeah, but anyhow, that, th those are really working cities and they are moderate sizes. You know, what you don't want is the Sao Paulo's. Mm -hmm. That is great for the, for the rich middle classes and the not so rich middle classes, but it's a horror for the workers, right? And um, so Latin America, I find very problematic. The United States in the big cities has that same syndrome though, that people have to travel enormous distances. So I, I think that we should sort of try to disassemble and create multiple centers so that it becomes more reasonable. You know, it, this is not reasonable what we're asking from our workers in our major cities in the Americas. And you can say the same thing for the big Asian cities, huh? that the workers are just paying an enormous price. And, and, uh, and I don't think that anybody gains from that, you know? And, and, uh, and, the, and, and the, the top rank in, in the big businesses, they don't even think, it doesn't even cross their minds because we have done some interviews, you know, they just, oh, oh, really? They, oh, they have to take these very long trips, right? And then they, of course they arrive very tired and that's not so great for the business. You know, I mean, it's unbelievable, but it's, they're honest, you know, they honestly hadn't thought about the notion that their workers have to travel often two hours or something, and then they arrive tired. So nobody gains, but you know, to change that could take quite a bit of effort. Because most of these people, they exist in a zone, these high income firms, they, they, they don't even, they're so busy you know, making money. I mean, they don't even think of other ways of organizing as long as it works, that's it. And so these are, these are the real issues, in, especially in large cities. When you have a medium sized city, it's just all simpler. Yeah. Now I love a big city, huh? I confess. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's it's been quite touching. People sort of talking about um, being able to hear the wind or hear breezes, or to talk about the, you know the extraordinary uh, sound of birds. These <laughs> simple, almost <laughs> banal things yeah. we've been so sequestered yeah. from for a long time. And I, sometimes it's these almost sort of trivial, quotidian details. 
which contain within them a kind of creed occur for another way of living or a, another kind of kind of, sort of urban, um, just another urban scenario. And maybe the, there's yeah, potential yeah. there. Yeah, my, no, my concern really is how do we get out of the modalities that we have now yeah, in cities, big cities, which means that all the top level brass want to li- want their offices to be in the center, tall and a hundred percent disregard for the trips that their workers take. You know, that to me is a basic thing that needs to be changed. <laughs>